Greetings and salutations, my friends, and welcome to our February wrap up, my Reason Reads wrap up, where I'm going to walk you guys through everything I read in the month of February. I surprisingly, maybe not, read a little under what I wanted to. I was thinking I was going to read 10 books again. I was thinking we were going to nail the hyper reading again. But turns out January was just a special month where I read a lot. I was overexcited. That's completely fine. I ended up reading one, two, three, four, five, six different books in the month month of February and I actually quite loved most of the books that I read. There was just one book that was under a four star but thankfully nothing so bad that it ruined the month's worth of reading. So I'm quite excited to talk to you guys about everything that I read this past month. As always let a girl know down in the comments what you read in the month of February. Any particular new favorites, disappointments, DNFs, anything you'd like to recommend me. I'm always really excited to see what you guys have been up to reading wise so do let a girl know all of that down in the comments as per usual and I hope we're excited to talk about these six books because I love talking about things you may or may not have seen. I know not everybody's watching the vlogs and so I love giving you guys like several different opportunities to hear about these books, to talk about these books. I also love hearing you guys' takes on the books I'm reading and also things sometimes change after I finish a book and I give my initial rating, so anything can happen in this household. But before we get started with today's video, I do have to give a massive shout out to Book of the Month for sponsoring today's video and being a long-standing partner of the channel. You guys know that Book of the Month is one of my favorite book subscription services because they allow you, the reader, to get new hardcover fiction at a price you're never gonna find at the bookstore. So if a book is typically $30 at the bookstore, you can get it at a much better price with Book of the Month. Now, if you guys are not familiar with Book of the Month, they are a super popular and fast-growing online book service for readers and their mission every single month is to bring us new and early release titles that they know we're going to love and they really do all the work for us because don't we know that sifting and looking through every single new release can be quite tedious. Their team is vetting through hundreds of books every single month and they bring us a curated selection from anywhere between five to seven book titles ranging from new and early release titles and going from new and emerging authors all the way to super popular authors that you may know and already love. What's so cool about Book of the Month is that they also do a wide array of genres. So they do historical fiction all the way to romance, fantasy, YA fiction, and just a ton of other things so that you're not caged into a single genre. And in my blue box this month, I got two books that I am super excited about. One being A Fate Inked in Blood. You guys know how much I love fantasy books. So this was a no brainer for me, as well as Anita de Monte Laughs Last because I saw not only the cover and was super intrigued because of it, but I also know that we follow the story after Anita de Monte and art student has died. And as a setup, I find that fascinating. And they're so awesome now that if physical books are not your speed, they also offer audiobooks in their app. So you can choose one or the other and really just enjoy reading in whatever format you prefer. So again, you can check the link at the top of the description to check book of the month out and use my code MELREADS to get your very first book for $9.99, which is honestly a steal. You're not going to find the price for new hardcover fiction anywhere else. And you can get excited and get your stunning blue box every single month. We're going to make our way out of order into the books that I read in February. And the first one I'm going to talk about is actually the last book I finished before the month was over. And that is Ricochet by Krista and Becca Ritchie. I promise you guys, every time I say this, I try and pronounce it correctly. I have been alerted to the fact that I pronounce Ricochet as Rick O'Shea, the proper name. And I don't know how to fix that. I've tried listening to the whole Google translate things and Google meaning things and Google pronunciation things. Ricochet. Out of my mouth. It sounds ridiculous. My Spanish speaking brain cannot compute the word Ricochet. This is the second book in the Addicted series by Krista and Becca Ritchie, in which we follow childhood best friends Lily and Lo. Lily, who is addicted to sex, and Lo, who is addicted to alcohol. And they have been pretending to be together for years now to hide their addictions from their families. And it comes to a head in the first book where we see them really enable each other and really instigate the way that they dive deeper into their addictions. But for the first time also, we see them dive into a real relationship. However, the dynamics of book one don't really lend themselves themselves to them having the healthiest of relationships. And a lot of times during book one, we actually see them trying to date each other, plus handling their addictions, put a huge strain on their friendship, on their dynamic, on their dating life. And so it's very difficult for them to do so. In the second book, we follow them as they get away from each other. That's like a really weird way and like probably a bad way to phrase it, but they basically take a little bit of time from each other, take distance in order to individually work through their own struggles. They basically come to the decision, come 
come to the understanding that by staying very strongly in each other's lives, while they are at their unhealthiest, they will cause more harm than good. And so it is decided by them and the people in their lives that they will take a little bit of distance to work individually so that when they come back together, because it's widely understood that they're not going to be without each other, whether it's in relationship or in friendship, that when they come back to each other, they are going to be better than ever. And what I really like about the second book is that we really see a lot of the dynamic between Lily and her sisters, Lily and her family, which is not necessarily something that we observe as closely in book one. I found that book one, because it's establishing this relationship, this partnership, this understanding between Lily and Lo, it doesn't allow us to see much further outside of this bubble that they've built for themselves. And so in the second book, we really get to see Lily's specifically outside of that element. Honestly, it's fascinating. It really allows you to see exactly what causes this, this coping mechanism to take place in Lily's life and how everything around her kind of exacerbates her need to carry out certain routines and how the people in her life really don't know how to navigate this space with her because they are not aware of what she's going through. And it was very heartbreaking to see Lo in a place where he was really working through everything while Lily was having a lot of difficulty managing everything. And that's not to say that she doesn't have a good support system because she does, but there are still so many unspoken things inside Lily that she needs to vocalize and work through in order to kind of work through everything that we don't necessarily see her do a lot of in this book. So it's a very heartbreaking, frustrating journey to see her kind of, you know, give one step forward, 10 steps forward, and then kind of draw three steps back and how heartbroken she gets at the fact that she feels like she's making no progress. And I can't wait to see what's going to happen in book three because the ending of this one is setting up a very, very interesting arc that's, I think, going to come up in book three. And I can't wait to see how our main characters are going to navigate all of that. Things that I didn't like about this book are primarily the fact that we see a lot of flashbacks to when Lily and Lo were younger and then messing with each other and then, you know, kind of discovering the, their, you know, their sexualities and what they like, what they dislike and trying to be like adventurous teenagers, which I don't particularly loved reading too much because it was so explicit. And so I I don't want to read about 16 year olds, you know, going at it and dry humping and doing all these different things. It's a little bit odd. They were a little bit cringy as well in the dialogue and the way that they were like dirty talking and whatnot. I just felt like it was a little bit misplaced in the wide array of the book. And there was also like this strange emphasis, which I know we're going to get into in the Callaway Sister series. And I don't know quite how I feel about it, but there was like a huge emphasis on the Reich Daisy, you know, situation that's building. And I don't know how I feel about it quite yet. Everything else about it, I really enjoyed. I loved any and all inklings and showings and progress with Kobalaway. You guys know Kobalaway is my favorite. And I don't know that by the end of reading the Addicted series, Lily and Lo are going to top them in any way, shape, or form. But I quite enjoyed this. I think it was a good ride. I don't love it more than the first one, but it was still a four star. It was still a good, enjoyable ride. Next up was my January book club pick for Patreon, which if you guys know me, if you guys have participated in any readathons in the past, if you're a part of Patreon, you know that my curse is to read books the week of the live show or finish it the day of the live show. I cannot get out of that habit. And so you already know that this book rolled over into February because what I do every single time. So I read What You Were Looking For Is In The Library by Michiko Aoyama. I have heard so many fantastic things about this book. It is a contemporary literary fiction, magical realism book. It's such an intersectional book that you really don't know where to categorize it because it feels magical, but we don't actually know if there is any magic happening, but it is tagged as magical realism. It's just such an interesting book all around. So in this one, we follow five different characters. So each chapter is its own kind of short story in a way, but they all interconnect as the book goes on. And we follow all of them as they kind of walk life a bit aimlessly. They are all at a death tower moment, if you will. They are kind of figuring out what the next chapter is for them, trying to figure out careers, retirement, what exactly it is that they want to do with their lives, what exactly it is they want to embark on next. And incidentally, they all find themselves seeking the refuge of a library. They all think it'd be a great idea to maybe pick up some books that'll help them on their journeys. And because of this arch they have, they end up meeting the librarian of that specific library who has the very particular ability of knowing exactly which book to recommend to you so that that can give you a little bit more direction on where to go, what to do next. And she nails it every single time. 
so we don't know as the book goes on whether this ability she has if it's innate if she developed it through time because as far as librarians go it is a talent in and of itself to know which books to recommend to be aware of the titles that reside in your library to know what exactly to you know hand out to people and so we don't know if it's that or if it's actually a magical ability that she possesses and so we observe each of these characters and their own particular journey as one of our characters is trying to figure out what to do for the rest of her life another character while she tries to figure out motherhood at the same time as her career another character who is trying to set up his own business to feel extremely fulfilled and pursuing exactly what he loves instead of settling another character who has never felt good enough for work and who doesn't really know what his calling is but who is incredibly passionate about illustrations and manga and lastly a character who is just recently retired and who doesn't know where he fits in anymore in society and so I love that each POV is so different from the other and it really is a story that just gets better as you continue reading. It has loads of pockets of wisdom and loads of lessons that are painted in a very simple way however in a way that makes it almost inspirational for you to go out and get whatever's next and so I quite loved that factor about the book that I think regardless of what you've experienced there is either a POV character that you can relate to the most or you can find little bits and pieces of each one that really encompass the way that you've experienced work life or your personal life or relationships and so I quite liked this book. At first I wasn't really sure what I was going to rate it because I was very conflicted in that I wasn't particularly wowed by the writing style. It was really plain and simple and I can't really tell obviously if it's a matter of translation or if it's a matter of that's just how the book was written and I also didn't particularly love the first short story nor the last one but I think as far as everything else goes it was really really cohesive and it was overall a good time. It's one of those books that kind of sticks with you so the more you think about it the more you can squeeze out of it and the more you notice and so we had a really interesting live show discussing this book and really kind of questioning what the characters were gonna do with their lives after the fact again if, if the book was actually magical or not so I think it made for a really interesting discussion and live show. I can't remember now what I rated this but I think I ended up going for a four and a half star which feels right to me when I say it out loud. A 4.5 seems right to me. Next up, I have got a romance book written in the stars by Alexandria Belfier, and I always struggle with her name, so if I'm butchering it, I'm so sorry, but I really loved this book. I have been saying for years now, and I don't know if it's the sapphic books that I've incidentally read, or if it's the ones being popularized a lot, however, I have found that there is a lack of really fantastic sapphic books, particularly in the romance department. I find that when it's done in fantasy, I typically like it a lot better, but I have found a lot of disappointing sapphic books in my lifetime, and I was craving something that gave me kind of similar vibes to Delilah Green Doesn't Care, something that is very well-rounded. So we got the characters' personal lives, and we got the romance, and we got whatever dynamic was in the middle of it, whether it's faking a relationship or hiding a relationship, and that it was done really well, and this really did it all for me. So in this one, we have a Pride and Prejudice retelling, as well as a Bridget Jones's Diary reimagining of sorts. I don't particularly love Bridget Jones's Diary and I can't really muster up the energy to really remember and recall a lot of the details so I won't speak on that reimagining aspect but I can speak to the Pride and Prejudice reimagining and say that it was done really really well as far as the characters personalities go and that idealistic persona who really wants you know flowers and sunshines and who expects the best out of everybody and who expects things to pan out in a very specific way versus that very grumpy practical to the point persona I think it was done to the point really matter-of-factly and really perfectly in this book. So we follow Elle and Darcy who are complete opposites. Elle who loves anything to do with astrology, she runs a very popular viral Twitter page that is relating to all things astrology, giving you the songs that relate to your zodiac sign and what to expect in this coming day and she loves it. It is because of her love for astrology that she finds herself yearning for her one true love, for her partner in life, for the love of her life, for her soulmate and so because of it she ends up going going on a blind date with her business partner's sister, Darcy, who is very matter-of-fact. She is very serious. She's very analytical. She knows what she wants. She knows how things should look. She doesn't really believe in anything mystical. In fact, it really kind of puts her a little bit in a grumpier headspace when she does kind of talk about those things or when she ends up meeting people like that. So safe to say, just because of the opposite personalities, this first date doesn't really go well. And then Universe had it that way that they would strike a a fake relationship. 
so that people would stop asking either of them how their love lives are going. And it was just the perfect setup for the both of them so that they could pretend to be together and their families would lay off them respectively and they wouldn't have to deal with the constant expectation to get with somebody, marry someone, and do all these different things romantically. And I quite liked the way that that came about in this book. I found that they had a ton of chemistry, which was undeniable, which I love. But more than that, it was the fact that the fake dating scenario really lent itself for them getting to know each other in the process and therefore start dating for real, which I think was a perfect setup for this book. We really get to see these characters, you know, intimate lives and we get to understand whether it is that we're being told it, but that's being balanced by actually seeing it. Where, you know, we're constantly observing and hearing how their familial lives and how their personal relationships in the past have affected the way that they view relationships, want them or not, and how that by consequence has made them act the way that they do now. And so we do get that part. We get to see these characters not only with each other, but with other people in their lives. But we also see them be very intimate, not only physically, obviously, but also through conversation. We see their different love languages and how that shows up in the relationship as well to keep building on that foundation, which I, chef's kiss, absolutely adored. Because we don't often see that in romance books. I find that romance books are typically to the point, you know, we meet each other, we fell in love, now we're fucking, and that's kind of the dynamic of it all. In this one, you really get to see how the main characters manifest and how they show their love to their partners. And I found that extremely attractive on both of the main characters, but also from the author, because I don't often see that and I absolutely loved all of it. It was a 4.5 star. Why was it a 4.5 star? Now I can't remember. At this point, I can't remember why I gave it a four and a half star. Clearly it was not memorable enough for me to remember, but I do agree that it's a 4.5 star, just based on vibes. <laughs> I think it must have been the third act conflict. It often is with me, with romance books. Next up, we have got my favorite manga. Don't you guys know it if you've been here for a while? Villains Are Destined to Die, volume four. I got this, read this in February. It was obviously not on my TBR, but it doesn't matter because I was really excited about getting this read. I have absolutely fallen in love with this particular manhwa. Manhwa is a Korean graphic novel and the illustrations are colored in as opposed to manga, which I find incredibly striking and just absolutely stunning to read. And so, I hold a lot of love for this. I have never read an isekai anything before. Isekai basically means that the main character is going into a different world and they have to survive that, whatever means necessary. So basically in this one, we follow our main character as she starts playing this really new popular romance game. And in this game, you have got two different levels. Easy mode, you play as Yvonne, who is the Duke's lost daughter. Her goal is to get back to her family and she does so with the help of her love interest. Now in hard mode, you play as Penelope Eckhart, who is Yvonne's lookalike, and she is the stand-in for said lost daughter. She is considered the villain, not because she's really, really awful or because she's done anything necessarily villainous. She really is a product of her environment, and because she's always been mistreated, she ends up being a very mean, standoffish type of person. And the point of her POV is to earn the love interest affection points so that they don't bring Yvonne back home and she can stay as the Duke's daughter. And the whole whole point of this dynamic is that in easy mode, Yvonne's mode, it's super easy to gain affection points and get back home. It's super easy to win the game. In hard mode, it's easier to lose affection points. And once all of them are lost, Penelope dies. She's killed by the love interest. And so it's quite an interesting dynamic, right? Just game wise. Our main character is playing the game. All is great and dandy. She falls asleep playing it. Come to find out, she wakes up. She is Penelope at cart. She wakes up inside the game playing in hard mode. And she has to figure out how to navigate this game as this character, how to win it, how to earn affection points. And it's obviously super fascinating because our main character has already played the game. She hasn't won it in hard mode, but she knows enough about it to know how to navigate the key components of it so that she can earn those affection points and really swing this whole thing to her advantage. And so our main character is getting smarter and smarter as she goes. She's really cunning. She's really smart. She really does know how to play this game. And it's so freaking cool to see her machinate all of that in a way that pans out, again, in her favor. Out of all of the love interest, I particularly love Callisto and I was really pleasantly surprised to see that basically this is Callisto's volume. This is the volume that we see her heavily interact with him, that we see his backstory, that we see just kind of how similar these two are to each other and why they complement each other so well. She doesn't take his bullshit. She is not very complacent with how he loves being doted on. Well, he allows her to be her strong self and he allows her 
to be very, you know, very independent and a goal getter and very fucking badass. And so they both kind of give each other their spaces or they tame each other down in ways that I don't find the other love interests do with Penelope. And so I'm quite excited to see where this connection's going because I do see it as the strongest connection we have made so far as opposed to any of the other characters. I'm excited to see where this is gonna go in the other volumes and to see what the end result is. Is our main character gonna stay in the game or not? And I find it extra fascinating because the whole reason why our main character, which we don't even know her name, which is why I feel like she's gonna stay in the game because I feel like she's being stripped of her personality and her name and her identity. And we only know her as Penelope, but I find it so fascinating because the reason why she goes in there is because her life is basically Penelope's, but in real life. There are so many similarities that it's it's honestly very hard to ignore. So that's why she's in there. I think it's, it's a fascinating thing to see how she decides to go about it all. So I can't wait to see more. I've already ordered volumes five and six. I think it's gonna be a great time. Don't know when volume seven is coming out, but I will keep reading regardless because not only are they stunning, but the story is freaking cool. And if you guys have any other manhwa recommendations, do let her all know because I want to see what the next best thing is. I want to see what else I can go into. If they're romance manhwa, it's even better. What do you think Mel would like? Because I don't know where to go next. It's very overwhelming. So let a girly pop now. Next up, we have got the first thing I finished in the month of February. I almost said March. Sword of Destiny by Andrzej Sapowski, which is the second set of novellas in the Witcher series. The reading order is always recommended as in read the novellas first. Gives a lot of context so that when you go into the main series, you kind of know the setup, are really familiar with the world, and that you are really familiar with the quest that brought Geralt to Ciri. The way this book ends is crazy. So I cannot wait to get into, I think it's Blood of Elves indeed, and see what the main linear storyline is going to do. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. If you don't know what the Witcher is about, we basically follow Geralt of Rivia, who is a Witcher, and Witchers are genetically enhanced from a very young age. They are basically mutated, so they can hunt down and kill very dangerous monsters. Geralt in particular is such a compelling main character because his moral code is very strong. He has his very clear set of limitations of what he is willing and able to do and not do. And it's honestly just great to see him traverse his different adventures. And so in this one, we've got a collection of short stories. I still am not aware because I know the first set of novellas, The Last Wish, they all are retellings of very popular or somewhat popular fairy tales. I don't know if this one follows the same dynamic. All I know is that this was a really, really strong book. I gave it four and a half stars. I didn't like it as much as I did The Last Wish, but I think this did a great job at introducing us to particularly Siri, who is Geralt's daughter figure, which we'll observe very closely in the main storyline. And so I was very pleasantly surprised because I didn't know if we were going to see her here or not. I was very pleasantly surprised to see her here and to see so many different conversations being established about Geralt as a character in particular. Because witchers are mutated and they are genetically enhanced in every way, shape, or form, they are basically a ghost of what they used to be when they were human. And so it is put into question a lot in this particular set of short stories about Geralt's humanity and whether or not he is feeling. His functions, both psychologically, emotionally, physically, all the things, are in any way, shape, or form akin to a human's. But we see that repeatedly throughout, throughout at least these first two novellas, that although he is, you know, a little bit odd in that, you know, he is his own supernatural creature, his own fantastical creature, we obviously see him be very sentient and feeling. And whether that's through emulating what he believes that should feel like or that he is actually feeling it, we don't see him be without feeling. And so it was really fascinating to see all of those things be established as well as diving deeper into his connection with Yennefer, which is his love interest. Yennefer is a really powerful witch, but we find out more about her own set of struggles in this one and her own dynamic with Geralt as her love interest, as well as other people who are also involved in her life somewhat romantically and how that affects her union with Geralt and how Geralt ends up realizing long-term what he technically should be doing or expecting or allowing to happen in this union because it's not all what he already perceives those things to be. And so I think it was a really good stepping stone just in terms of growth for Geralt. We obviously see all of that through the scope of the different short stories and what the companion characters, side characters are experiencing. I think is a fascinating way to relay those lessons, obviously, because it's not directly happening to Geralt, but he learns it basically secondhand, which I think is pretty great. And we get introduced to many other mythical creatures, things that we didn't really know existed in this world. And I think exposure-wise, world-building-wise, the novellas are so rich. And so I really loved this. I listened to the audiobook. It was 
fantastic and I already got the audiobook for Blood of Elves so I'm quite excited to dive into that. And last but not least I read Her Radiant Curse by Elizabeth Lim. This is technically the prequel to Six Crimson Cranes though it can be read individually. However after reading this before reading Six Crimson Cranes because I have not read that duology yet I don't know that I would recommend reading this book outside of that duology or before the duology because I think that the experience of reading this will probably be enhanced by having read that original series first. I still had a good time with it. I think it was really good world building wise, but I didn't find this particularly exciting as the book specifically kept trudging along, nor did I find it so wowing that I would give it any more than a three star. So that's my rating for this one. I gave it three stars. I think it made me more excited to read the, the duology, to read Six Crimson Cranes and The Dragon's Promise, and I do own both of them. Specifically with the tidbits and the foreshadowing that we got to the main series, I think it makes me really excited to see Chani, our main character, in that setting to see what happens over there and to see exactly what the main series of events are. But basically in her Radiant Curse we follow Chani and her sister Vana, who are basically told the prophecy that one sister must fall for the other one to rise. And basically when Vana is born, a witch in the forest, the demon witch, claims that she needs that sister's life, so Vana Anna's life in order for Chani to live. However, it doesn't happen that way and instead a curse is placed on Chani that gives her a serpent's face. And so basically the entire book focuses on Chani trying to save her sister as her sister incidentally finds herself in peril over and over again because this demon witch is hell-bent on getting Vana as she didn't get her like 17 years in the past. And so we follow Chani as she is trying to save her sister's life and potentially figure out a way to get this curse on off her to trying to find a little two for one. And the book starts off really, really strong. I think because the book is set to be a mythology retelling, a Beauty and the Beast retelling, I've heard so many comps at this point that it made me really excited to go into this and potentially experience some purple prose. And I do think the beginning of the book was more akin to purple prose than not. However, the book was not writing wise what I think I would have preferred or wanted. And so that alone was a little bit disappointing right from the get-go. I loved that we had an animal companion. Maybe not so much what type of animal companion this was, because it was a snake. But aside from that, by the way, context, I'm, I'm like deadly afraid, irrationally scared of snakes. That's why I say it. So I surprisingly really loved the companion a lot. I think that Ukar's banter with Chani was fantastic. However, that's as far as my enjoyment of this book goes. I enjoyed the exposition. I enjoyed Chani as a main character. I enjoyed Ukar as the animal companion. And I loved the world building aspect because I think it sets up the main duology quite nicely but aside from that I really disliked the love interest. I think Hoksu as a love interest made no sense and I really don't know if this was a case of the author attempted a love interest romance dynamic in here that just didn't work or if the publisher pushed for romance in the book. Either way I didn't really love the way that that whole thing manifested in the book because I found that they had no chemistry romantically. I also didn't like Vanna at all. I was expecting a different outcome or a different set of circumstances circumstances to happen in the book and I think it would have made for a really interesting story had those things happened but basically I wanted her to be evil like I genuinely wanted her to be a bit antagonistic there were also other things that I didn't necessarily love because they were under explained like Chani's prowess fighting wise she was really good at fighting but we never really see her training there were loads of time jumps and explanation jumps that don't really allow us to understand too much of this dynamic that exists in Chani's life and so I think it, it requires a little bit of a suspend of disbelief when it comes to, you know, to this book to be able to flow through it quite nicely. So parts of it were frustrating, parts of it were strong, but I wouldn't say don't read it. I would just say probably read Six Grims and Cranes first. So these were all the books that I read in the month of February. And honestly, aside from her Radiant Curse, it was a really good reading month. I think everything else was either a 4.5 or a 5 star. Oh wait, no, Ricochet was a 4 star. But anyways, I think it was a really good reading month overall. I'm hoping for a little bit of a better March. I think that the selection I have got, if you have not watched my March TBR, I'll leave it linked down below, but I think the selection we have got for March is superior. I'm just saying. I think I'm gonna have a really great month reading-wise in March, and honestly everything else. March is not allowed to be a bad month. I'm just putting that out there. So that's it for the wrap-up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, don't forget to give it a massive thumbs up down below. Subscribe if you haven't
haven't done so already for more content like this. And let a girl know, as always, what you read in the month of February. What did you guys rate the books? Again, if you've got some manhwa recommendations, do let a girl know. Because again, I'm looking for like the next best series because I am loving Villain to Destined to Die, but I just know I'm going to go to some sort of withdrawal after I finish that sixth volume because <laughs> we don't have a date for the seventh one. So do let a girl know if you've got any recs on that end. And if you reach the end of the video, let us leave a tiger emoji in the comments for her radiant curse or a snake emoji also. Either or or both. It works out perfectly. And let a girl know if you've read any of these books as well. I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts on them and see what you guys experience while you read them too. If you'd like to support the channel further, I always say it. Patreon is the place to go. It is always linked down below. In case you want to join a book club, a discord server, all of the different live shows that are happening and all of the fun activities overall that we have got going over there that you're not going to see anywhere else. We have got a bunch of exciting live shows upcoming, including cozy game nights and movie nights and a readathon. So I'm just saying, you may not want to miss any of that. It is always linked down below, as well as the rest of my socials in case you guys want to check me out anywhere else. And yeah, love you guys so, so much. And I will see you on the next one. Bye.